Hello, friends. Hello. We homeschool, unschool. Fun. Fun, fun school. school. <laughs> but it's not always fun, is it? No. <laughs> it has its moments. It's definitely got its moments. <laughs> and one of the places that has had the most moments has been with mathematics. And we've been using something called uh, Khan Academy online, thinking that it'd be important to have a math curriculum. We kind of followed a more standard route with this one. But we kept finding that we'd sit down to the computer to do the math, fun schooling, and what would happen? It, it just didn't go well, <laughs> as we've said. People would get upset, not just children, but parents, too, would find the threshold of frustration and then fall off the other edge of it. Uh, and even though we talked about it as a family, it was a repetitive cycle that seemed to keep happening. And I want to jump in and say we have tried other things too. We've tried some written workbooks. We've oh, yeah, tried yeah. Um, those uh, puzzles, we were, the horse puzzles and stuff that has. We, yeah. We've written some stuff out, but we've actually done workbooks specifically mm -hmm. for, so of various different kinds. And again, different you know, interest in that, but still always coming back to it isn't necessarily the math that's the problem. It's the act of doing the math or something. <laughs> so we puzzled over it for a long time. And we discovered something really cool that not only applies to homeschooling or mathematics, it's actually even not just about interacting with children. This has to do with interacting with people in general, whenever you start to feel a conflict arising. So today we're going to share our discovery with you. Okay, so what is our discovery? Our discovery was that in any moment when you're engaged with somebody else in a goal-oriented activity, there's kind of two ways you can look at that. The one is that the goal is what you're trying to achieve. The other is that a deeper relationship and connection is what you're trying to achieve. And the result, when you approach things in those two different ways, is very different often. I often think of tents. Setting up a tent okay. is a great way to assess the relationship of a <laughs> husband and wife or partner, you know, boyfriend, friends, girlfriend, even. even friends. And the thing that you, well, you do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> People can get really upset setting up tents, especially the old fashioned ones. You know, Nowadays this doesn't apply anymore. Easy. You just we're, push the button, right? Like we're dating ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Remember if you're, you know, a little bit older in your years, and you have to stick the things together and maybe twist them oh, in little buttons. Oh, there's a lot of complications. Are... Yeah. Tent technology has come a long way. <laughs> anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about an activity that in general can push the boundaries of people being patient with each other, etc. When you are focused on the goal, that sets our mind in a, in a very certain way. We're just thinking about the goal. And it's very easy then to see another person as interfering with the goal and they don't even actually have to be actively interfering maybe they're just doing it in a different way <laughs> or not on your perceived timeline if it's not matching up to your expectations of how that goal should be met we've all experienced this right then uh, we start getting upset and that's where the funny part about this whole thing happens because it's supposed to be about the goal but then when we get upset, it becomes about the relationship. In this case, a conflict in the relationship. And we spend the time and energy we would have spent mm -hmm. trying to achieve the goal in conflict, in this relationship <laughs> mess up. It's where something that could take 10 minutes eventually takes an hour and 10 minutes. And before you know it, you're sleeping on opposite sides of the tent or one is, one is in the car and one is in the tent. <laughs> At any rate, it's sort of our, what we think about something and how much value we give the goal really can start to undermine everything. When you are trying to achieve a goal with somebody else and instead of 
being focused on the goal, you're focused on the relationship dynamics and the, the connection between the two of you, then same way that when we were after the goal, we ended up focusing on the relationship instead. When we focus on the relationship, we often become focused on the goal instead because we are keeping the relationship smooth and that allows both people to optimize and to move towards that goal more efficiently. So in a weird way, we achieve the things we're trying to get at much more efficiently. I'm just going to paraphrase that. You're yeah. saying in one Was way. Was I confusing? A little bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> circuitous? Yeah. So in the first way, we're so focused on the goal that if a relationship thing gets in our way, we often don't achieve the goal in the stated timeline or the way we wanted. But when we're focused on the relationship, we often achieve the goal much more quickly without really being so focused on it. Isn't that what I said? <laughs> now we used all this time. You're okay, just saying quiet. what I said. Listen, this is what Do I want to say. see how it can happen? <laughs> but really, that's how it can happen. We can start getting into this huge conflict because one of us is so goal-oriented, <laughs> me in this case, that... <laughs> I'm feeling goal-oriented. <laughs> Like get to the point. Look, people's time is valuable. Do you want to sit around like. and listening to us have an argument? This is the simple way that I think about it. There's me and there's him. And we're two separate people and we're trying to do something together. That's way number one. Or there's me and there's him. But we're a team. And our, our biggest goal is to still remain a team and to meet our challenges in a way that we're still a team afterwards. And it doesn't matter what, quote, the goal is. The whole point of it is to just remain a team. So how does this apply to the math fun schooling? Yeah, well, it's interesting because we sat down and talked with the girls about this, and we actually call it emotional resilience training because essentially we said the math isn't important. Okay, you're going to eventually know how to do math, so it's not how many problems you do or how well you do on a test or anything else. The goal is when we sit down to do math, we're actually going to be a team and the goal is that we remain able to communicate with each other mm. through the time frame that we do math. So if we need to take a break and we need to breathe or we need to communicate about our frustrations. And it's been very interesting because initially we ran into, oh, this is so frustrating or whatever it is. And it was very nice because we could practice in real life communicating, talking about tools to get past the frustration or whatever else it might have been. And we're to a point now where we're able to use those tools more readily. And a lot of times we don't even enter into that place. <laughs> we have some spies. We don't even enter into that place where we get frustrated. But when we do, we realize it's not about getting through the math part. It's about staying connected as a team. As a parent, one of the challenging things about this is that you have to be prepared when you sit down to quote do math which again we call emotional resilience training so we remind ourselves why we're really sitting down what we're really practicing you have to be prepared for the fact that one problem one question of math may take you 45 minutes because it isn't about that getting that problem done it's about you and your child finding that balance of being able to be a team and work on the challenge. And the challenge sometimes is just, I was having fun, I don't wanna be doing this. I'm the parent, I'm giving you my time, why are you wasting my time? And so you have to be prepared that sometimes when you sit down to do this, it will take you a lot longer. That's where this applies to all kinds of things in your life. Because this idea of emotional resilience training if you take that and you swap it out for whatever your goal is, it's going to apply not just to your things that you're trying to do with somebody else, but often the things we're trying to do solo. Because when we are trying to achieve a goal, that's when we often run into portions of our personality that are eh, maybe not super highly developed. Most of us as kids and now as adults, we haven't had training mm -hmm. in things like frustration tolerance. So as soon as we start to get a little bit frustrated with something, ooh, that builds up. We lose our ability to think creatively and efficiently. 
and we get sucked into the frustration. Because we haven't learned this, ah, we are all pretty weak in that. Not all of us, but most of us are pretty weak in that arena. So by saying, let's forget about the math, not forget about it, but kind of secretly <laughs> put it aside and focus on the emotional resilience training, then we are giving children a tool that will not just serve them when they're trying to do math problems, but will serve them in so many broad areas of their life. And at the same time, we'll make it so that a couple of weeks later, yeah. math is flowing smoothly instead of being a, ah, a big fall apart every single time you try to do it. So you achieve your goal by letting the goal go. It's very zen. It's very zen. I think what really struck me there about what you said is realizing that for children, for all of us, we have places that we haven't developed skills. And I don't think that children are intentionally trying to be rude or mean or frustrated on purpose. They just aren't prepared to deal with, maybe it's transitioning from doing something fun to doing something that they perceive as less fun. I mean, I don't like that. If I'm enjoying a book on the back porch and someone says, oh, by the way, it's time that you need to go in and you know scrub the toilet, probably I've trained myself, okay, I need to do that. I like to have my toilet clean. But I'm probably not thinking, yay, woohoo. So I just think it's really important to also hold that idea in your head that people, that when you lack a skill, that's where you're going to see things that seem like disobedience or disrespect because there's a skill that hasn't been learned. And so it's great to be able to have this emotional resilience training because how else are you going to learn something? You have to practice it. You can't just practice being frustrated with something if you're not frustrated. You have to practice exactly. it in the midst of being frustrated. And that's what I really like about this. The other thing that I really like is that it begins a dialogue in our family about this topic. And I feel like that's really, really important in today's age. I wish that they would teach this in school is how to communicate about your strengths and your weaknesses, about your concerns, about what you're feeling or why you may be doing something. And we always ask our kids, why are you doing that? I can't explain half the time why I'm responding. You know, maybe it's hormones. Maybe I didn't sleep well. I don't know. So if I can't always answer it, how can I expect my child to sit down? Well, mom and dad had a difficult day yesterday because Abigail wasn't nice to me in art class. You know, that kids aren't going to say that any more than a grown up would. So <laughs> asking why that doesn't help. But having a communication as a family about, hey, we all have this, including us. Sometimes I need the emotional resilience training. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't handle it. <laughs> okay, deep breathing. <laughs> That's so important to remember because often, whether we're working with children, our children, adults, we often want to kind of blame their behavior on ill will. And just think for yourself. The last time you lost your temper, was it because you were purposely trying to be a jerk to someone maybe in a few cases <laughs> there are some people that's true but in general it's because we lost emotional control mm -hmm. because we were taken beyond our emotional skill level yeah. and that is that is the key if we just make this switch from achieving the goal to emotional resilience training we're going to build up our emotional skill level so that we don't become frustrated. And then, poof, magically, we're gonna find that we are not as flying off the handle. And in this case, our children or whoever it is are not losing it in the same way. So that defiant child that you have that is just trying to get in your face and doing things to antagonize you, you might find, wait a second, when I was just telling them, you can't do that and getting back in their face, it just kept getting worse. But when instead I see them not as purposely defiant, but as unskilled emotionally, and I give them the skills, then the situation changes. One important point about this is that when we start doing math, it's emotional resilience training, we sit down to do math 
and things start to tumble apart, it's not just about fixing it or getting through it. We need to see those as opportunities when, okay, frustration is arising in myself or in the child. How can we train ourselves to be more apt at dealing with that frustration? And that's the one pitfall, I think, in this whole arena, is that we can sometimes think, okay, this is just about saying to the child, it's okay, it's going to be fine, soothe them down, let them relax so that we can get back to the math. Look, we had victory. No, we need to really be aware of, wow, look, we're coming into frustration land. How do we navigate our way out of that? Well, I feel like there could be a complete kind of series addendum <laughs> to this <laughs> video because it is really important to realize that when frustration happens, what I tell the girls is, hey, hooray, you're frustrated. This is exactly why we're doing this. Or I'm frustrated. Hey, this is my chance to practice. It is definitely like going to the gym. This is your chance to do your push-ups, And this is the hard work. But this is why we're doing it in the first place. If we just do math every day and everybody's happy, we won't actually get to use those muscles. And so the first thing I say is, hey, congratulations. And it's very important to point out, okay, we're entering that place. Um, the second thing, this is just an aside, is to recognize that if your child is dysregulated, and this goes for whoever you're talking Wait, to. What do you mean? We haven't heard that word here. Dysregulated. dysregulated. So essentially, when we start to hit a skill that we are not very good at, uh, let's take the frustration tolerance, and I'm getting more and more frustrated. It's our little amygdala <laughs> um, that's kind of ruling us. It's the little me. I will not be able to hear and understand some of these concepts. So it's really important that as you enter into whatever the skills are, that you need to work on, that if a person or a child is very upset, the first thing we have to do is to get back to a place where we are relaxed. And that's the first thing, to recognize you are in that state, and then to say, okay, what did we talk about, about how to get ourselves back to a relaxed, we call it relaxation with the girls, but back to a regulated state where there aren't a bunch of chemicals zipping around our body where we are breathing more relaxedly and that might look different for different people our girls both have different ways of meeting that area and bringing themselves back to a relaxed state so we can then talk about stuff a super cool thing that you did here is you turned the negative experience that initial frustration into something that you congratulate somebody on <laughs> They always would look at me in the beginning. What? <laughs> Why are you saying this is good? <laughs> and that teaches that mistakes, pitfalls, challenges are not negative things that we should run away from or be afraid of, but that when a challenge comes up, it's a positive thing because it's an opportunity for growth. It's important to be flexible too, I feel, and note for example, maybe you had a late night and you were gone all day at the park the day before playing and your child maybe is more tired and you hit a, a place to practice. Maybe you need to kind of recognize, okay, I'm going to, normally we do an hour of math or whatever, but all I want to do is get my child, they're really freaking out. All I want to do is get them regulated and get a one small, you know, step into this is the only thing we need to do and then call it good for the day. So remember to be flexible. Again, it isn't, we're gonna do an hour of math. It's, we're gonna see what happens. Sometimes you can do more. Sometimes you're on a roll. If our girls are feeling good, they go, hey, let's do more. I'm kicking butt today. This is awesome. And some days all it is is, okay, we hit frustration. Let's relax. We hit frustration. Let's relax. If we hit frustration one more time, our end goal is just to get back to relaxation and we call it good. So there's got to be that flexibility. The other part of that is recognizing your own emotional state and talking to your child about it and saying, oh, today I have let much less patience. Uh, we're going to have to still be a team, but let's really check in with each other. And I'm going to let you know if I need to take a break and take some deep breaths and really stay on top of that because that's a great way to model for your child how to be. It's great for kids to see that grown-ups are still working through things. We are not perfect. 
And, and sometimes it offers them the opportunity to reflect what they've learned to us and say, hey, mom, it's okay. Do you want to just take a moment to get a drink of water? And then we can talk and we can try this again. This runs deep into our cultural training because you might find yourself thinking, well, kids should just learn to buckle down and just do something whether they want to or not. And that's part of our old kind of industrial cultural training to make us into good cogs in the machine. If you're trying to train your child or yourself to be a good cog in the machine, to just slave away for somebody else your whole life and not care about your own goodness or happiness, but just provide for the goodness or the happiness of the owner of the company, then this is good training to teach people to just sit down and do it. I don't care whether you like it or not, just do your work. If, however, you want your children or yourself to live creatively within this culture, to look at the rules of the game and say, how can I live within this mm -hmm. in a way that is going to maximize my joy and happiness and maximize the joy and happiness of the people around me? Because if you're being kind to yourself, you're going to be kinder to others. If that's the kind of transformation that you're looking for in yourself and in our culture, then this kind of training that we're talking about here, where you look at life, all of our goals as a chance to explore yourself and grow yourself rather than just meet the goal. This is the change we can make, but it, it does run deep, this training. So you may find yourself, if you're a parent, for instance, sometimes just saying, you've got to just buckle <laughs> down, but think for a moment about what that teaches. If you, like me, like you, have spent maybe many, many mm -hmm. hours, days, years of your life just, well, in our case, working in some factories with no windows, just enriching somebody else with our labor for pennies, then maybe we look at this and say, maybe this isn't serving anything good. It's important to realize that it will take time, especially if you have a defiant child that has been mostly raised schooling wise by other people and you don't have a deep connection or you don't talk a lot about this, you have to be prepared for it to be a little while before your child goes, oh, my parent is serious about this. And by serious, I mean, they're actually not being super serious. They're talking about stuff totally differently and they keep talking about it and they, they keep showing up in a different way. You have to give things some time just the way that you would want to be given time if you were learning something completely new. If your boss suddenly showed up at work one day and had everything completely backward from what you were used to, it's going to take a little bit of time and you might need to give yourself time too. Mm -hmm. So try not to be hard on yourself. Try not to be hard on your child. And you have to set your own goals for <laughs> goals for what you think is going to bring you satisfaction because that's what we're talking about here is a relationship with your child and with yourself and your own emotions that gives you satisfaction you say hey some days are harder some days are awesome but overall i feel really happy that i can communicate with my child i can communicate with my other parent partner and we have a system that's working for us and we're really learning and we're really growing and over time you'll know it's helping because you'll be able to look back and see, wow, we couldn't have ever done that before. And now we can. This is major retraining, my friends. So like she said, give yourself time and understand that it creates an entirely different way of living than what we've been used to before. So it is well worth the effort that we put into it. It's a deep topic and I feel compelled to commit to a further video that Ooh. might go deeper into some of the things that we actually do during the time frame that we're practicing our emotional resilience training, specifically uh, some of our problem solving skills. So we'll do something like that in the near future. Um, otherwise, we would love to hear from you if you've got questions, uh, what you do to, you know, 
keep your emotional resilience training going in your life, some of your experiences. And a final thought is just to remember that we've been talking about children, but this will work with your partner, it will work with coworkers, um, it even can work with strangers that you run into, all on different levels, but it doesn't only have to apply to working with children. We can use this all across the board through all of our encounters, whoever it's with. All right, my friends, I look forward to talking with you in the comments. Thank you. <laughs>